We will give this a go until the internal temperature of this here beautiful Ram diesel 2500 heats to about 100 degrees. It's only going to take a minute and this singular tree in the Walmart parking lot is not really adding much shade. When I stopped producing videos in the fall, I said that I was going to be taking a break because I wanted to write out the book of the van adventure, the seven months the really the full year, but the seven months that I was on the road and everything it took to build it and blah, blah, blah. But mostly I wanted to write the why, because that part I did not put on YouTube. Nobody, well, a couple people, mostly the pretty much all naked soy boy man bun types of van life. But most of the people who you actually meet out on the road living in their RVs and vans, there is some story as to why, because it's, it's not terribly normal to forgo your home or your apartment or plumbing and electricity and want to live out in a car. So everybody has a why. And I didn't, I put some of that up there, but not really a whole lot. And there's a lot that happened that I couldn't put on YouTube because if you put a video over two minutes long, this will absolutely be over two minutes long. People complain that it takes too long to watch. So none of that was on there. So I wanted to put it down on paper and I believe in the story because it's mine. <laughs> but also, I just think that after the past two years, there's a lot of general despair. People have lost their jobs, their livelihoods, and that was a big part of the reason why I did the whole babe bus in the first place. And then what happened? Like what was the, everything that I learned out on the road. So I started writing it. I thought that at most this is gonna take me three weeks because I know the story. I was there. It took until June. So from October to June of just any time I got free time, I shut all the blinds and sat down and I rewatched the videos. And then I tried to remember everything from behind the scenes. I looked through my photos. I looked at some notes like on the back of travel brochures. And I wrote out the whole story, 78 blessed chapters. Patreon has been wonderful. They have proofread and reviewed and given me feedback about everything, but I, I just, I finished the whole thing and I was so proud of myself. Then you have to go into the actual, like pursuing a publisher route. I do not want to self-publish because people I, who I know have self-published. They sell one to their mom, they sell one to their aunt, they sell one to the neighbor across the street and that's all that happens. I had put months of work into this and I felt, and I still feel strongly that I have something of a proof of concept because tens of thousands of people actually watch the story. You have to go through this like whole publication thing <clears throat> where you submit what's called a query letter, which is basically like the back of the book. And then they want, this is just one example, the first 100 or first 50 pages. And each one wants something different. And to even find a publisher, you've got to go on these websites and then read through what, what they're looking for. And what I learned from that really quickly is that what publishers are looking for is reflective of whatever the social sign of the times is. And White Girl in a Cargo Van is not high up there on the list. You have to submit comps, like how I submit for a house I'm selling, of like other books that are like yours and how many did they sell and when were they published and why is yours different. I mean, it is an extraordinary matter. I had no idea. When I go into a bookstore now and I just hold one in my hand, I think, oh, my, I know the work that went into this. If you wanted it all the stores, you got to get the big publishers. You can't get the big publishers unless you have an agent. I mean, it is just, it is a lot. So I finished all this and I was so proud of myself. Still am proud of myself. And then I sent it off. I might actually have the list in here in my book. Yes. Yes. I sent it off to all these agents and I've been scratching them off as they ease reject me. I knew that I wouldn't get a thumbs up immediately, but because this is the story of my life and not just some fantasy tale that I made up while sitting on the toilet, I didn't realize how personally I would take it every time I get a rejection letter. And worse, when you get a rejection letter, they don't tell you why. They just say thanks, but like this isn't what I want. So I should have been rejection letter after rejection letter after rejection letter. I had enough of that. And I thought, well, I will hire an editor and then I will do it like through some medium, like not big box publisher, but not selling it on Amazon, I'll do something else. I can't even find an editor. I can't even find someone who I will pay 
to get this book in tip top shape and to send it out. It's terrible. If you want to get really comfortable with rejection, write a book. Write a book or ask me out on a date. One or the other. They're both going to train you on hearing no without any explanation. So I'm kind of at a crossroads with this. I will be posting more videos. But what I did want to do, because when I put that first video up and I said I'm going to write the book, and I got a bunch of you know, the usual crappy response, which was, it's already been done, everyone with a van, they write a book, it's not interesting. And I said, yeah, I've read some of them, but th yes, the story is about what it was like to travel around the country in a van, but it's a lot more than that. And most of it, at least the beginning, is the why what happened and I think part of the reason I've had trouble publishing it is those first chapters are dark they are very dark because that's how it was I was not life wasn't perfect and then I said you know what let me throw this all away <laughs> let me drop my dream job and I'm just gonna go live in 60 square feet that's not how it went it was a lot of loss which I think is very relatable to a lot of people right now and probably even more as this government continues to try to drill us right into the ground so I'm gonna do the thing that you do when you write a book which is you read it chapters and I may just make this an audiobook and put the pictures up online along with the videos I'm not sure um, but I think this chapter a lot of it is about the van but at the end is sort of the why and this part I never shared any of it on YouTube um, so we'll just start this is chapter 13 of 78 <laughs> Um, and I don't have a title for it, but just just be quiet and enjoy it, okay? Just, just buckle up. All right, chapter 13. By mid-November, the van's elevated platform bed was finished. A little foot ledge helped propel me up and over the mattress, though too much momentum united my skull with the ceiling. Underneath was the crawling closet, remember that? That housed my electricity-providing deep cycle batteries. It also offered general storage and rods to hang the sparse amount of clothing I plan on bringing. There was plenty of room down there to hide lay shitter. In the event, I'd be entertaining guests inside my cargo van. That never happened. Lay shitter happened, but there were no guests in the van. RV refrigerators demand enough electricity to require being plugged into a 30 amp source or run off a separate propane tank. I had neither, so I would need a low wattage fuel fueled by deep cycle batteries, which would be charged by the alternator as I drove. A truck supply store offered the perfect solution. The truck fridge was long and narrow, meant for resting between seats in a commercial hauler. At most, it held a couple cans of soda, a pint of milk, and a box of my veggie burgers. I would need to go grocery shopping daily for the rest, but that was okay. I was only going for three weeks. Remember that when I said I was only going to go for three weeks? That solution set me back $500. Small as it was, the truck fridge still took up precious real estate inside the van. It would have to do double duty. A friend built a wooden box and lid to house it, thereby giving the fridge a second life as a sitting bench. Not wanting to stare at a plywood box, I found a few yards of the most garish neon pink sequin fabric and wrapped the outside. I stapled a pillow to the top of the lid and covered it in an even brighter pink fuzzy fabric resembling the head of a troll doll. Now I had a glitter shitter and a sparkle fridge. Somewhere, a truck driver rolled over in his grave. The cabinets came from Lowe's, two sets of drawers and a sink cabinet. I glued in magnets to keep the drawers from flying open on sharp turns. When the back doors of the van were open, I could see down the street my beloved babe cave. That was my house that I had to sell. Without a shower in the babe bus, I couldn't recreate my copper penny lined shower. Instead, I built a penny countertop in the kitchen. I replicated the pressed tin tile ceiling in my former master bedroom using tiles I found in someone's garbage pile, complete with a decorative ceiling medallion. Antique drawer pulls were added, old doorknobs acted as coat hangers, and the metal wall-mounted baskets were hung to store keys, pens, and of course, very sharp knives to murder intruders with. Transforming the ugly into the beautiful and repurposing the unexpected had given me so much joy when I was restoring my home. Now I was back in flow. 
picking out each little accent to make every square inch special. I was so involved in the van project, I had largely forgotten my problems at work. Todd and I, Todd was my boss, never really address, addressed the issue of my contract expiring. I just kept coming to work and so far the door code kept working. By then I had resolved all the financial obstacles. Private health insurance was in place as was a personal cell phone. My 401k would be rolled into an IRA. The cleanest cut from corporate to unemployment would have to happen at December 31st, so I would give two weeks notice and hope they didn't show me out the door sooner. Around Thanksgiving, Todd called me into his office. We hadn't spoken much since the year prior when the news of my this is not a demotion demotion was delivered. On my way into his office, I picked up a freshly printed resignation letter off the printer, just in case. Todd had papers in front of him, which I assumed were my termination papers. I sat up straight and prepared to interrupt him and hand him a set of my own documents. Hey, I know it's been crazy around here with Hurricane Florence and you've been working without a contract, but uh, we should really get this buttoned up. Here's your new one. I stared at him, then the papers, then back at him. In a cartoon, this is where we'd hear the sound of the record scratch as it played off track. A new one? A new contract? For 365 sorrow-filled days, I had been on edge waiting to be fired or laid off. I had sold my home and purchased a cargo van and a glitter toilet. My bank account had a Pavlovian response to that stack of eight and a half by 11 papers in front of him. It was the anxiety soothing balance protecting security that it offered. If I signed it, I wouldn't have to go live in a cargo van. I could go buy another babe cave. I would have great health insurance, my family of coworkers, my role in the community, a take home car, a cell phone. I would have my normal back. All I had to do was sign. We are reminded of a different redhead who faced a similar problem, the Little Mermaid. Let the record show that she too signed a contract on impulse and ended up naked with a talking crab. These contractual comforts were all seductive bribes in exchange for the one thing I truly cared about, my stories. I wouldn't be getting those back. There was no place in local news for my kind of journalism anymore. In this life, we get what we tolerate. With my signature, I would get exactly what I had been getting for the past couple years. My life would be easier, but not happier. What made me happy was seeing my ideas that were in my mind come out on screen and feeling like my work made my city better than it was the day before. That wasn't going to happen if I signed myself up for a few more years of live reports on poor drainage at the municipal golf course. In the uncomfortable silence of Todd's office, I thought about what had happened a year prior. I thought about the van and I thought about my grandmother. Her death this entire past year and my near life shortening depression had put into motion a mission to look up. I asked myself the same question again. When it's your time to look up at that hospital ceiling, what decision will you wish you had made right now? I'm going to stop here, I said. My last day will be December 31st. We both sat mute long enough for Todd to blink twice and then pull the papers slightly back towards him. I always envisioned I'd go out in a blaze from TV news, both middle fingers up in the air, wheels spinning as I pulled out from the parking lot. Instead, it was just sad, yet another death in its own right. Todd didn't say much more and I was finding it hard to fight back tears. I mustered up a thank you and went back to my desk. That night in the van, I screwed an antique metal compass inside the door and stapled a map of the United States to the wall. It said that when you get to the island, you must then burn all the boats, meaning once you commit to your decision, your destination, destroy any and all modes of turning back. No second guesses. Commit. That day, I torched every ferry, kayak, jet ski, yacht, and submarine at the dock. So that is only part of the overall beginning, but I think it was one of the more important chapters because while I did lose my job, while I did nearly kill, try to kill myself several times, 
and um, everything was just a fire and brimstone hell. There was a point where I could have changed everything and gone right back to all my creature comforts. And instead, I still ended up in that van by choice and the whole adventure that went on after that. So, so there you get a little insight of the beginning and maybe it's terrible and maybe it shouldn't be published, but I'm really hoping that I can make this work because if I can get it in print, then I can get another RV and get back on the road selling it. But in the meantime, I'm just going to ask formally because I have found on the magic of the internet that when you need something and you can't find it, ask someone else. So surely there has got to be someone who knows an editor or a publisher or an agent who can get this party started. Because otherwise, I gotta go keep showing a bunch of houses. <laughs> now everything's going really good in real estate, but I do need this story to see the light of day. And I do need to hold a printed version in my hand because we did the YouTube, we did the video, but I do think it needs to be a book or at least an audio book. And then obviously the longest TED Talk series ever in history. So I'm asking directly for help. I need an editor, I need a publisher, I need an agent. Somebody who is gonna give this a little bit more grace than 30 second review on an email. So get to work on that weirdos. <laughs> I'm gonna go into Walmart to make myself feel better. Every time I go in there, I come out just feeling better than I was before. I have all my chromosomes. I've not beaten a child in the bread aisle. So I'm gonna go for a little pick-me-up and uh, I'll see you in the next video.